Hi, everyone out there. A warm welcome to everyone um, for this conversation and poetry reading. Uh, we have with us uh, Rosina Mort, who is in uh, Ithaca in, in the States. Especially warm welcome to you, of course. Um, and um, to make a short introduction uh, of you, uh, for those who, who um, haven't uh, made any acquaintances with you yet. Um, well, Zina Mort, you're a poet translator, and you translate between English, Belarusian, R Russian, Ukrainian, and Polish. Um, born in Minsk, 1981, and then you emigrated to the States in your 20s, I think. But you've uh, you've been back many times. Have you have uh, cultivated, you know, a close relationship to to the country and people there? Um, besides uh, writing poetry and and translating, you you also teach at Cornell University uh, contemporary poetry, literary translation, and creative writing. Um, and. This fall, uh, your third book, uh, Music for the Dead and Resurrected, uh, was published. Uh, and it has been quite an unusual past six months uh, for you. Um, and I think maybe, you know, the first thing I would just like to say hi to you and also ask, uh, how are you and how have has the, the past six months been for you? Because I mean, I, I know that you have been working tirelessly um, to, to spread information and tell people what is going on in, in Belarus um, in, in, in many various ways. Um, yeah. Uh, hi, Ida. Uh, hello, everybody in Sweden and in Belarus and around the world. Um, I'm uh, very glad to be in conversation with you, Ida, uh, in this, on this Saturday morning for me um, in spring, in early spring, uh, because uh, you and I uh, have been working tirelessly together, too, <laughs> in this past few months, uh, translating uh, Belarusian literature, Belarusian voices, and um, uh, also working um, between the two of us uh, because you're translating music for the dead and resurrected into Swedish. Um, so um, that's, you know, <laughs> we are Belarus is the country of bogs yeah, and swamps. Once you put a foot in, <laughs> we suck you in. <laughs> <laughs> so you started translating a bit and here you are we are finishing finishing music for the dead and resurrected in swedish but also you've translated julia timofeva's book right of prose the diary um and i know that you i think also uh, worked on uh, dmitry strotsev's book in uh, swedish yeah, not me personally, but yes, it does. Yeah, help. yeah. <laughs> Um, so um, you mentioned that I was born in 1981, and I'd like to start there and say that um, uh, I came of age in Minsk uh, when I turned 18. It was 1999, which was a year when um, uh, the Minister of Eternal Affairs, Yuri Zaharinka, was abducted from the street in Minsk and he was disappeared. He was abducted and murdered, though if you check his Wikipedia status, uh, under his residence, it says missing. Um, and uh, the same year in 1999, Viktor Hanchar, a politician, was also abducted together with a businessman, um, Krasovsky, and um, the two of them were murdered too and they're also in the status of missing of two people who were disappeared. And then when I was 19, so in the year of 2000, on the brink of the two centuries, um, journalist Dmitry Zavatsky was abducted. 
uh, and also disappeared and murdered. And um, so I came of age uh, in a country uh, shaped by these disappearances. Uh, these uh, three these three men in particular, their faces that were carried around the city protests, um, they have really entered my imagination. And there is not a day, in fact, that goes by without me thinking about them, without me um, looking inside myself, like into a mirror and seeing their faces reflected back. And also perhaps because poets tend to dwell on things, right? And get obsessed with things is um, to obsessively imagine the ways in which they were murdered. Uh, Zavatsky in the forests, a short dead, um, uh, beaten probably Zaharinka shot dead in the woods. Um, that's just something that doesn't leave me. And so, I I know that this is the country that I came of age in. I know that everybody who works in our military, who works in our police, who works in our special forces, are people who uh, give oath to the murderers of this people and to the country that goes on, um, goes on without solving these murder, these murders. And so what has happened in uh, since what has been happening in Belarus in the last 30 years and in this past year, starting with our latest uh, presidential so-called election, um, is all for me um, uh, not news, but just uh, different forms and levels of the same violence. Uh, so um, violence that is intentional, that is banal, that is routine, and that is just somebody's job, and nobody is doing this violence um, out of mistake, uh, out of some kind of inertia, or because they're on drugs. <laughs> uh, no, I think that it's calculated and intentional, um, and um, uh, so. Um, the, this past uh, year has been a year of the escalation of what we have already seen. Uh, and uh, the these brutal beatings every time remind me of these missing people. Uh, and the detentions remind me of the detentions that have been happening for the past 30 years. Um, and um, the, uh, any kind of talk of victory here, I reject, as uh, I think that is a very misleading goal, that there cannot be victory already. Um, and um, uh, very often I've been asked in this past uh, months uh, by journalists to just give a poem about violence <laughs> to them. <laughs> <laughs> to how about I would come in on a radio program or <laughs> for a journal and read or publish a poem about violence that is happening. And so this, this kind of banality of violence that is happening and inside the country and the banality in which people want to talk about it too. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, of course, you know, we are also living under a pandemic in the past year and for a whole year, scientists have been working on a vaccine and a lot of people do not trust these vaccines, but uh, the words that a poet would put together <laughs> in a week, uh, people are very willing to trust. Mm -hmm. Yet I think that in many ways, poetry is a medicine, right? It is a kind of a vaccination. It is a pill, a very condensed pill that uh, we should not trust, first of all, uh, too willingly, too easily. Uh, but when it's good, it works on us like medicine. I think it's interesting that that now you've you've given us the picture of internally looking and uh, looking in a mirror, mm -hmm. 
and now also you you have the pills so it's there's this direction here of going inwards right and and i would like us to to get back on that later on also poetry moving inwards um but um I know also, I mean, you've done a, a huge amount of work in trying to get the messages across and, and giving readings and so on and, and so forth. I just I just wanted to know if you wanted to say something about how the reception has been in the US. Do you feel like people are listening or, yeah, is there um, a way to... I think that there is some attention on the political level and also uh, in journalism, there was there was some coverage, yes. Mm. Um, but it was also, but I do not think that um, the tragedy that happened to Belarusian people in this past year have really entered people's hearts um, because for too long before that, Belarus was not a part of people's picture of the world. Nobody thought of Belarusians. Uh, nobody listened to our music, read our books. Nobody said, oh, you know what? It's, it's Friday night. Let's go to a Belarusian restaurant <laughs> tonight. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> um, uh, or when people bought, you know, some uh, clothes and where it says that the linen comes from Europe, I always smile, you know, I know it's Belarusian linen, yeah. <laughs> but nobody thought so, that they're wearing a little bit of Belarus on them right. when they put on what they put on that linen dress in summer. Um, so, and uh, the only way that we were known is through our um president of um, 30 years um, and through the cliche uh, of the last dictatorship of Europe, so much so that I think that it became a joke, a very cruel joke. Uh, our uh, uh, our people were seen as a kind of a joke, right? As a babushka <laughs> in a um, in a scarf, um, and uh, yet um, Nina Baginskaya, yeah, the babushka of our nation is nothing like that. Yeah. And uh, and um, that cliche has dehumanized us. And uh, once you once you are dehumanized, it's very um, it's impossible for people to empathize, really. Yeah, yeah. And I think again, this is a, it's it's a question of mirroring, right? Because if you have the country has no name and you're not seen, so you're not getting mirrored from the outside. And when where do you start looking? And I, and I think that that is of course a, a theme throughout your your book, music for the dead and resurrected, the the missing, the missing pieces, the missing. Uh, the missing graves and the missing uh, parts of, of, of certain stories. Um, and, uh, Ida, I realize, sorry to interrupt, I, that I did not really answer your question about <laughs> what was I doing in writing. And now you are reminding me of that when you talk about um, that kind of um, the, the humanness and the ordinariness of life. Um, and um, a lot of, uh, so, so there was the cliche of the dictatorship and a dictatorship is something that is far away always. Yeah, it's a remote country, even if it's your neighboring country. But then there is also this other narrative in which Belarusians were portrayed as extraordinary and uh, so heroic and so me, 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 as we say. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and um, so is a model, an example of courage and creativity. And for me, with, with my writing that I have been doing in this past month and in my interviews, I wanted to insist that we are ordinary people, just like you, are ordinary people and uh, we want to have very ordinary things not taken away from us like the desire to just um, live our one short life with people we love right with our friends doing the job we want to do we love in a place we love and uh, we do not want to be kidnapped by a madman we do not want to exhibit all of this courage. We do not want to be models for creativity um, 
while while we have been beaten uh, to death and into coma. So that was what I insisted on in, in what I was writing. We're just like you. And this can happen to you too, because anything that happens anywhere can happen to you too. Uh, and what we deserve is not being put on a pedestal, uh, but an ordinary happiness, an ordinary life um, that we build for ourselves. So not to be kidnapped from that. An ordinary unhappiness also, perhaps. Yeah, yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. And if we have an unhappiness, let it be ordinary, which also brings me back to music for the dead and resurrected and those graves and the missing people, uh, which is because it's a book about uh, the legacy of um, uh, violent deaths in a family. Uh, right. And so uh, I, I know that people die and I know that all of our ancestors are dead. Right. That's the property of our ancestors. That's what happens. But uh, that they were not given ordinary deaths is the burden and the an ordinary happiness, uh, unhappiness and sadness with which a lot of Belarusians live, knowing that our ancestors died young and violently, and that they were not granted natural, ordinary deaths. And so how can we live now um, the heirs to that legacy? What is ordinary life for us? What is ordinary happiness and ordinary sadness for us when we are the heirs to this extraordinary legacy of violence? And I think one way, you know, that that becomes uh, uh, apparent in, in your poetry is also that you can imagine uh, one of your poems being like, this is supposed to be a poem about the day in my childhood. But then suddenly, you know, there are bones everywhere. There's this dog coming with a bone between its teeth. There's a bone lying on the kitchen table. You know, it's like it's all of those, you know, deaths and, and, and that heritage. It just makes the ordinary po poem impossible in a way. And, and and forcing it to, to see those those pieces as well. Um, uh, time is like flying away, I think. Um, and there's so much to talk about. Maybe um, maybe we should should read a little and and then um, uh, continue. So we'll read from from music for the dead and resurrected, uh, music for dom döda och återuppstånda which uh, will be published in Swedish in, in June. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, we will read in three, in three languages, uh, some in English, some in Belarusian, and then Ida will read in Swedish. And um, I cannot over express my gratitude uh, because uh, the work of translation is um, um, is a, a really a, the amount of a sacrifice <laughs> and it takes in terms of it's, there is not a little moment of selfishness in that work. Uh, there is so much generosity uh, that goes and that the work of translation demands um, of us. And I'm internally grateful to you, Ida, for that. Thank you. I see this literary activism, actually, this kind of translation work. And in a way, I'm relieved. I, I don't feel forced to, 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 to blow up things. I can translate poetry instead. Uh, so we'll read four poems and we'll start with Bus Stops, Ars Poetica, which is um, a little tour around um, Minsk and uh, around um, uh, my the apartment of my childhood and um, some objects uh, that were telling their tragic histories. Not books, but a street opened my mouth like a doctor's spatula. One by one, streets introduced themselves with the names of national murderers. 
in the state archives, Kava's hardened like scabs over the ledgers. Inside a tiny apartment, I build myself into a separate room. Inside a tiny apartment, I build myself into a separate room, peopled it with the calibans of plants for the future, future that runs on the schedule of public buses, from the zoo to the circus, what future? What is your alibi for these ledgers, these streets, this apartment? Future in the purse that held through seven wars, the birth certificates of the dead, my grandmother hid from me chocolates. The purse opened like a screaming mouth. The purse opened like a screaming mouth. Its two shiny buckles watched me through doors, through years, through jazz. Who has taught you to be a frightening face purse? I kiss your buckles. I swear myself your subject. August, apples, I have no body. August, for me, a ripe apple is a brother. For me, a four-legged table is a pet. In the temple of supermarket, I stand like a candle in the line to the priestesses who preserve the knowledge of sausage prices, the virginity of milk cartons. My future, small change future that runs on the schedule of public buses. Streets introduce themselves with the names of national murderers. I build myself into a separate room where memory, the illegal migrant in time, cleans up after imagination. Bus stops, my future, an empty seat. In a room where memory strips the beds, linens that hardened like scabs on the mattresses, I kiss little apples, my brothers. I kiss the buckles that watch us through walls, through years, through jazz, chocolates from a purse that held through seven wars, the birth certificates of the dead. Hold me, brother apple. Busshållplatser av poetika. Inte böcker men en gata öppnade min mun likt en doktors spatel. En efter en introducerade gatorna sig själva med namn på inhemska mördare. I de statliga arkiven hårdnade mapparna som såskåpor över akterna. Inuti en mycket liten lägenhet byggde jag in mig själv i ett avskilt rum. Inuti en mycket liten lägenhet byggde jag in mig själv i ett avskilt rum. Befolkade det med framtidsplanernas kalibaner. Framtid som löper enligt stadsbusstabellen från zoo till cirkus. Vilken framtid? Vilket är ditt alibi för dessa akter, dessa gator, denna lägenhet, framtid? I börsen som under sju krig. Höll födelsebevisen för de döda, gömde min mormor undan choklad från mig. Börsen öppnades som en skrikande mun. Börsen öppnades som en skrikande mun. Dess två blanka knoppar såg mig genom dörrar, genom väggar, genom jazz. Vem lärde dig att vara ett skrämmande ansikte, Börs? Jag kysser dina knoppar. Jag svär att bli din undersåte. Augusti. Äpplen. Jag har ingen. Augusti. För mig är ett moget äpple en bror. För mig är ett fyrbent bord ett husdjur. Inuti livsmedelstemplet står jag som ett ljus. I kö till prästinnorna som bevarar vetskapen om korvpriser, mjölkkartongens oskuld. Min framtid, något litet i växel. Framtid som löper enligt stadsbusstabellen. Gator introducerar sig själva med namn på inhemska mördare. Jag bygger in mig själv i ett avskilt rum där minne... Tidens illegala migrant städar upp efter fantasi. Busshållplatser. 
Min framtid är ett tomt säte. I ett rum där minnet bäddar av sängarna. Lakan som hårdnade som såskorpor över madrasserna. Kysser jag små äpplen. Mina bröder. Jag kysser knopparna som ser oss genom väggar. Genom år. Genom jazz. Choklad från en börs som under sju krig höll födelsebevisen för de döda. Håll om mig, äppelbror. The next poem is called New Year in Vishnyoka and I'll read it in Belarusian. Vishnyoka is a small village in Belarus. And I invite you there during the new year night, which is a magical night when there is a little time shift. And during this little crack when the one year ends and the other begins, um, well, some visions are possible. Снег зяє і освітляє забой свині. Мама відмовляється від 100 грам. Мама згаджається на 100 грам. На стіні диван з півонями, їх барв'яні роти усмоктують мені у сон. Малую мені уклали тости про стіну. Моє колиханки. Мама каже, ні-ні-ні, на 100 грам. Ложек пахне валенками, не зводячи в очей з мене кот, ліжа лапу, бицем вострить нож. Мама кричить, так, на 100 грам. Мамини груди за великі до ранішніх забитих автобусів. Невідомо, чи виросте з мене чоловік. Але раз на год у вишньовці свиню забили. Мама шепче так, 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 так. Наступним ста грам. Я зникаю півоневим горле. Півоні пахнуть валенками, кривьой свині на снезе. Що за дивну лыжню покидають стрелки годинника? Нью-Йорк і Вишнюка. En vag visa. Snö glimmar och får grislakten att mjukna. Mamma avböjer mer att dricka. Mamma går med på ett glas till. På väggen en matta med pioner. Deras purpurmunnar suger mig till söms. Liten, jag har nattats. Skålar genom väggen mina vaggvisor. Mamma säger nej, nej, nej till mer att dricka. Min säng luktar valenki. Utan att släppa mig med blicken slickar en katt sin grå tass som slipade den en kniv. Mamma ropar ja till ännu ett glas. Mammas bröst är för stora för att rymmas i knökfulla morgonbussar. Det finns en osäkerhet kring om jag ska växa till en riktig person. Men en viss dag i Vishnuka slaktas en gris. Mamma viskar ja, ja, ja till mer att dricka. Jag försvinner in i pionernas strupar. Pioner luktar valenki, grisblod i snön. Klockarmar lämnar ett underligt skidspår. And maybe we read one more and then talk a bit how do yes. you feel today i suggest you read one more in english and then we can talk after that okay so i'll read little songs um about how um that, that has to do with how life begins very ordinary and people um are born in the house and uh, they live in that house uh, they work in it 
yet their graves are found nowhere nearby the house. There's always something extraordinary that happens at a certain point that displaces them and removes them. Over these houses, like dead men's hands, the roofs are folded. A train, dogs rattle chains. Window sills snowed over with weary flies. Amelia drinks thick coffee. Janina shares utensils like playing cards. Yusefa, after loud theatrical farewells, is dead. Yusefa crunches members of broken households. She budgets children and relatives, subtracts the dead, carries over the missing. It is a math problem she buries with herself. All windows in bright white, a step house with step inhabitants, born in this kitchen, back three times a day to have a meal in the place of their birth. Yet none is buried anywhere close. Yanina shovels snow piles of flies. Like a manly tear, a bird glides across the air. Chains follow dogs as if chains were discharged like slime. Justice has turned out to be more terrifying than injustice. Yanina falls like dust onto her bed. To look healthy, leave that to animals. Once, a tank drives through a street here. Like an elephant, it waves its trunk from right to left. An elephant in our village, instead of hiding, women run to look. Since then, many birds are shed across the air. The dents on cups gag many thirsty mouths. What has been done to us is muddled with the fears of what could have been done. Our famous skills in tank production have been redirected at students and journalists. But under the truth, folded like a dead man's hands over the house, we still live. But under the truth, folded like a dead man's hands over the house, we still live carrying buckets between a tree and a beast. And instead of evening prayers, I plead with myself to just leave you be, my dear, my undear Lord. Thank you. So in, in um, many of the poems, we uh, meet a young girl living in Minsk, uh, growing up. Um, you've said somewhere that that the book is is working with the themes of of music and and trauma. And uh, speaking of the ordinary, I often sense that the, a poem is set in in an ordinary space, like a kitchen or playground or you know familiar uh, grounds. Um, and then uh, within that space, something happens. Uh, and, and you start sensing uh, uh, something acute and, 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 and violent and, and worrying. Um, and uh, you've also spoken about uh, your grandmother, growing up with your grandmother, like in that kitchen, and how she was, uh, for one thing, giving you stories all the time uh, about the history of Belarus and her history. Um, and also she was your music teacher. So in a sense, we get a, a picture of someone who is both giving you a language to tell stories with, uh, but also, you know, musical language. And, and so I'm thinking in what way do you see uh, music and trauma happening in, in that kitchen? Mm -hmm. um, yes. Um... Well, um, my grandmother, who has passed now, would be very happy that we're talking about her. 
Um, she <laughs> talked to me every day, um, uh, well, five days a week on the weekends. Uh, my parents would be home, right, um, not working. So my grandmother's stories would stop. But then on Monday, they will resume. I will return from school and I would sit down to have lunch in the kitchen and my grandmother would sit down across the table from me and say have I ever told you about my life and she would say it every day and she would repeat the same story which was the story of survival um, uh, which was the story of loss of her parents and the war and the post-war years and I would hear the story every single day and the story was violent and um, the story was extraordinary, uh, yet it always happened at this most ordinary moment and place one could imagine. In the kitchen, in this apartment block <laughs> um, and uh, eating potatoes. <laughs> yeah. And um, um, uh, she could not stop. Uh, uh, telling them to me, and I had no choice not to listen to them. Uh, but also there was always the third element present in that, uh, in that uh, kitchen, the third voice. And that was the voice of the radio. Because for my grandmother, radio was very important. Was I announced on the radio, right? The beginning and the end. I announced on the radio and my grandmother spent every day after the war listening and worried that the war would be announced again. Uh, she was somebody who lived through hunger, so she was also collecting bread, bread leftovers and drying them and keeping this huge bag of dried bread in our, in our kitchen just in case we would have to go hungry. Um, and she was pretty obsessed with it. And my mother and her always had the conflict over this huge bag of uh, dry bread that was sitting in the kitchen. <laughs> um, but, uh, but so the radio was on and you could never turn the radio off. Even at night, we slept with the radio. My grandmother and sister and I shared a room. Um, and... Um, but uh, the radio at the time, and that's the 80s, yeah, and the 90s, um, I don't know who was speaking music there during the lunchtime, but that was somebody with a wonderful taste in music. And uh, there were no very little news that I remember, but I remember just an endless supply of Mozart, endless supply of uh, Skriabin and Rachmaninoff, uh, Bach, music was always on. And um, if this story, I already said that the poem is like a very condensed pill, yeah, like a vitamin. And I think of music as a dilutant, right? It's, uh, it's the water into which you drop that story. It's something that makes it possible to digest it. And looking back, that's how I explain my ability not to go insane completely with listening to her stories daily because music was always there and music was always the background and it always gave a shape, right? And it was that other dimension um, that would open up every time that she would start speaking. So, um, it was like she she opens this door here into the horror of it, and the music opens the door immediately, opposite to her voice, into some kind of possibility of um, um, that could negate the horror of it. And so for me, music is is uh, that kind of a dilutant is the is the water to the pill that is the that intense story of survival uh, i was listening yesterday uh, uh, to a conversation and and the lecture uh, by nadia kandrusevich she loves who is the translator and, and the publisher of, of children's book 
uh, she lives in Minsk. Um, and she also wrote a, a brilliant text for, for our issue in Pen Up about the children in Belarus, uh, about the children's awareness of the situation right now, of the state violence surrounding them, of the parents going to jail, or of you know suddenly just not being allowed to dress up as you usually do as a snowflake for the Christmas party at, in, in kindergarten but uh, being forced to dress up as a Christmas tree in, in, in green and, and red. Um, and growing up it, or being in this situation surrounded by violence, which is also the situation that you are describing in various ways in, in your book uh, uh, with pictures from your childhood. Um, Nadia, she stressed the importance of also through, through literature to give children a sense of freedom opening a door, opening a window, but allowing them also to use their imagination to, to, to try and imagine something else than the, the present situation also. Um, which made me think of, of a colleague, Somaya El Susi, when she was in, in Gaza with her children and she was reading Pippi Longstocking, uh, Astrid Lindgren's uh, children's book, in, for the, the exact same reason, in order to, in an occupied uh, country, uh, to, to give the children, you know, keep their imagination alive. And reading your poems also makes me wonder how, how you managed to stay like, free in your mind as a child, how you could uh, find a, a voice of, of your own, which is a very strong and fierce voice, but it is also a tender one, a caring one, and, and a sensible one. And this is um, uh, the brilliance also of, of your poems that you are managing to keep a balance and a play between those things, saying that it happens in the same room at the same time, they're both, both present. Um, but Nadia, she also was worried about, you know, in, in going on as usual or trying to keep up normal daily life, that the violence might, might get neutralized. And of course, it might get neutralized, but also internalized. And now I'm thinking of the mirror again. Um, and, and that being a threat of saying like, this is acceptable, we will still go and buy a, a book to read, although there is a, a, a true disaster going on uh, in form of, of state violence. Um, you, I love that essay by Nadia. Uh, I think everybody should read that essay. <laughs> and um, I was translating it into English and I was in tears uncontrollably. And just thinking about it again brings tears into my eyes. Um, and um, it's true um, that, uh, you know, I was born in early 80s. And from early kindergarten into school, uh, from everywhere, we were told that we are the generation of peace, that we, uh, that we should constantly that, uh, show the gratitude uh, for this peace that we have inherited, that people died and sacrificed so that we could have this great peace that we were living in. Uh, yet, uh, there was, um, but, but everywhere we went as children, there was so little freedom, starting with kindergarten, uh, where there was, where, you know, bullying was completely normalized, and where uh, in school too, um, I felt that the, we were watched and the teachers, what, used, what the teachers used as models for us was um, that kind of, strength and cunningness and um, knowing to be forced to hurt, knowing to be forced to threaten, yeah. Uh, kindness was seen as weakness always. Um, and um, so we were a generation of peace that was prepared, was being prepared for a life of violence always. There was always the tension that when you know we you would run into the store to buy milk and bread 
and um, an adult could scream at you uh, at at any point because maybe you drop the money when you were paying for things and you could be called names by the adult strangers and everywhere where you went as a child you knew that adults have full power over you as that you as a child have no right and no power and no freedom at all you were always at the mercy of adults who were angry always and always exercising their power and strength yet they it, when you too already then they had no power and strength and their only power and strength was over us yeah oh, because we were small and weak um, and um, and so it's and i do not think that much has changed since then because our educational system from kindergarten to university is completely subservient to a very Soviet ideology uh, that does not want, of course, any free people. Uh, that it, it doesn't want to see kindness as strength. In fact, it does not even understand what it means. Um, and uh, so what, and now I was thinking that I was that last generation of children who grew up with grandparents who lived the war, lived through the war. And so we touched them, right? We hugged them, uh, we kissed their faces and through their bodies, we were always in touch with that history. That history was so physical for us because it was lived through their bodies, right? Their bodies were in danger, they were hungry, the women were raped, and, and we were on their bodies all the time, and so we were always in touch with that. And I thought that with that generation gone, these new children, right, these new seven-year-olds today, um, they already would have a much healthier relationship with the history because for them, uh, it would be history that they could study, that they could talk reasonably about. Maybe they would not feel the need to write poems about it the way <laughs> that I felt the need to write poems about it because for me, it's mine. This history is mine, even though I was not born yet. This is the childhood of my grandmother. But through our physical contact, I felt very much in touch with that history. And so I was hopeful that now this would be the inheritors of peace, truly. <laughs> yeah, these children who also never knew um, the Soviet Union, for instance. I was saying the kind of circumstances in which I came of age. Um, but there are people now who are coming of age during this violence and they're shaped by this. And here we go, and here we go. There is uh, new violence and new trauma and uh, the, in this constant deja vu um, and inability to break out of it and the illusion of this peaceful generation that we are bringing up. Uh, so what, it, what is it that we are hoping now is for maybe the children of those people who are seven-year-old now Maybe they will be the generation of peace. Yeah, this is what we have to imagine now because the children now are shaped by this violence. Those who see it violently, those who see it and those who are loved and helped by their parents, yeah, who, uh, and those who are sheltered from it. All of them still are inheriting it. Well, you know, it's, it's so good and interesting to talk to you. Um, time is just flying away. And I think, why don't we just, you know, put a comma in, in our conversation? And uh, I'm sure we will go on and continue uh, to talk about your, your book and your writing and, and uh, so on and so forth. And um, I'm really looking forward to it.
Uh, thank you so much, Ida. I love the idea of putting a comma here. I'm uh, really looking forward to my book in Swedish, and I'm really looking forward to meeting my Swedish readers and to having uh, these conversations with you, with them. So it is indeed a comma. <laughs> yes, comma, comma that. Thank you. Thank you, everyone who was listening. Thanks. Thank you. Tak, dziękuję.